Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for six, uh, $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our six lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is a, a, real, a look into real life value stream mapping. Our speakers today are Jeff Kies, who is a VP of product at Flutura. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Hey, fantastic. Awesome, awesome. And Helen Beal, who is a strategic advisor at DevOps Institute. Hey, Helen, thanks for joining us. Great to see you. No worries, it's lovely to see you too. Thank you for having great, me. Great, great. Uh, Jeff uh, and Helen, I know you guys have a great webinar on tab, so I'm gonna take myself off camera, put myself on mute and let you guys get right to it. Awesome, thanks so much. I, if you haven't been on our webinars before, you this would be a, a something that you'll want to remember and, and come back often. You're in for a treat. I first met you, Helen. It's been a, a couple few years now. And I have to admit, I was I was doing a briefing uh, to who I thought was a reporter. And then I ran into Helen. And it was like, clearly, um, wow, the expertise and the background just blew me away. Helen has been in the industry for a long time and really a, a used to define herself with a special word around DevOps and was heavily involved in the process of coaching teams for DevOps and has since uh, caught the vision that DevOps is a great start, but there's another level that needs to go on that's beyond that. And what I'm excited to do is to walk you through some things that she's learned in her travels of, of working with different clients, very big enterprises down to smaller companies, um, software companies and so forth but helen is a very accomplished writer industry analyst um uh worked with a number of companies like i said so that's what i'm excited so helen thanks for being here man wow i've got a lot to live up to <laughs> <laughs> well it's true and that's why this is why i like these uh webinars with you it just you you have such a wealth of knowledge and so you if you haven't listened to helen before you're in for a treat well helen uh, take us through what we're going to talk about today. Well, we're aiming to look at kind of real life scenarios around value stream mapping. But I think we'll start looking where it came from and then actually figure out why it's useful. I don't think we do enough of talking about why stuff is actually useful and can be practically used to help improve. Um, but then we will give some tips on how to actually do it. So, um, as you said, I've done this thing uh, we call value stream mapping for quite a few times. I've lost count a long time ago about how many times I've done this in all sorts of different types of companies. Um, and then we're going to map onto that uh, how it links to value stream management. And this is the, the bit that uh, when you and I met, um, I got so excited about because this is the bit that really lifts DevOps to the next level. Um, in my personal opinion, and actually it seems like it's shared by quite a few people in the market, um, but I'm sure we'll touch on that um, as well as we go through. So that's our flow today. Love it, love it, love it. So well, I guess we're going to get right into uh, where does value stream mapping come from? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a kind of clunky phrase, isn't it? Considering what we're really doing is visualizing work on a wall mm -hmm. or, a, or a, in today's environment, a whiteboard, a virtual whiteboard typically. Um, but I discovered this quite recently, actually. I discovered that um, back as far as 1918, we can find uh, printed evidence of humans thinking about visualizing workflow in the business context in this way. So there's this book um, published by uh, or written by C. Knoppel, uh, Installing Efficiency Met Methods. And in it, uh, I'm going to call him Charlie. Charlie says, uh, without the knowledge of what your work is really costing you, you are in no position to say what extent your real costs vary from what your work should cost you. You have mm -hmm. no gauge performance. 
Further, because you don't employ time study methods and have no definite tasks, you have no means of knowing what performance should be. Consequently, lacking standards and with no provision for measuring attainment, you can readily see that it's a case of flying blindly. Mm -hmm. And I read this, and it's in the introduction to this book. You can read the whole thing online. It's it's uh, there's reproductions of it online. What really struck me from this is it is uh, 112 years old, but I could have read it yesterday. It's like I think we're still suffering from this. This kind of lacking standards and with no provision for measuring attainment. So many organisations go into DevOps journeys, in particular, with no provision for measuring attainment. There's no uh, baseline set on how we're going to measure progress as we improve uh, as we go um, through our DevOps journey. So I was amazed when I saw this. So that was kind of like, oh, it goes back further than I thought because. Right, because <laughs> we, we we now look to move things forward. So, so th I think generally when we talk about things like value streams and value stream mapping, it all harks back to lean. And then when we think about lean, we trace it back to Toyota and TPS, the Toyota production system, back to the, the 1950s. Um, so this is a chat. <laughs> yeah, well, what is that board back there? What is that exactly? I'm not 100% sure, but it's definitely cards with work descriptions on them. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if it's Kanban because I can't quite see the columns, but oh, it's column, definitely right. some kind of predecessor of us visualizing work in a way that we can collaborate on it. Um, so, yeah. But why, so why was it important then, as it is now, to make the work visible? Well, that's a really interesting question because Toyota, of course, are a manufacturer and they were manufacturing cars at these particular plants where this stuff emerged from, um, which have very visible parts to them. They have bits that people uh, machine and touch and connect together and, and build a whole other finished product or finished machine uh, out of that then ships off. Um, what's interesting about our world, the technology world, is that our product is to all intents and purposes, quite invisible. Of course, we have um, user interfaces and GUIs and stuff like that, that you can kind of see bits sure. of them, but a lot of the time we can't see that work. So while in the 1950s, the guys had realized that they needed to make that work visible in a way that they could all coordinate and collaborate over it. For us, it's even more important because a lot of the time our work is completely invisible. So we need to make it uh, so that we can see it. Yep. Well, let's get to you know today's you know what what are what are some of today's body of knowledge around value stream mapping then to help us. So I pick these three books out because not just because they're all written by Mike's, although that is a nice coincidence that each one has Mike as author. But um, the first one, Mike Rothers, um, was. He's called it learning to see. So what we were just talking about in terms of making work visible and being able to see um, our workflows and understand where bottlenecks are and use all these lean um, ideas uh, was very much kind of, uh, I want to say codified, it's probably the word, wrong word, documented um, in, a, in a way that people could understand them in 1998 by Mike Rother. Um, and then that led to Karen Martin and Mike Osterling producing their value stream mapping book in 2013. And if you look at any of the videos with Karen in particular talking about why they wrote that book, what they wanted to do was kind of translate Mike's Rother's work, which was very manufacturing centric, um, to a sort of enterprise industry agnostic model where people could use the value stream mapping tools and practices, but apply them to, I don't know, healthcare. So for example, it's very popular to use it in hospitals and things like that. It's quite sure. popular to use food delivery and things like that. So they kind of um, made it more horizontal. And then uh, starting with Mike Orson and moving beyond there, Mike Orson wrote the lean IT field guide that you can see there in 2015 and started taking these lean practices and really applying them to the technology fields. So you can always see the evolution of it from manufacturing to enterprise to technology across those three books. Yeah, for sure. And you bring up a good point. I mean, there's a, a journey here of showing that what was in manufacturing is different in technology. So what is different about technology value streams? I think a couple of things. First of all, what we just talked about, that the work to all intents and purposes is pretty invisible, the, the product yeah. itself 
it's very difficult to, to grab hold of because it's all code and bits and bytes on bits of machines or in the cloud. So it's kind of quite difficult to grab hold of a cog or a door and, or a window and say these bits fit together okay. in that way. It's kind of hard mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and the other thing, and we've, we picked on um, or picked out a piece of work from Gary Groover here because Gary Groover is particularly good at pointing out that code is different from parts of a car because in a, when you're making a car, you make the same part over and over and over and over, and then you create a product that ships. Whereas in software, we're creating slightly different parts every time, and they're creating them for one big product that never ships, just the enhancements. So we have this concept of moving from project to product, but our product, our car, stays there and gets bigger and bigger and kind of more complex over time. So whilst there are lots and lots of things in Lean that are really useful, we also kind of need to remain cognizant of the the differences so is value stream mapping still apply in technology yes because at the very core of it what value stream mapping is is concerned about is the flow of work and it's about improving that flow of work by visually collaborating on it and in that respect everything still applies we've still got work that's flowing and whilst one piece of code might be different from the next piece of code there's still pieces of code and they're still shipping into our product, even if we're not shipping car off the car off the car off the car off the, eight, the, the end of the line. We've still got a consumer coming in to experience our new mobile experience or whatever it is over and over and over again. So whilst there are differences in the model that we need to take into account, um, at the core of it, looking at the flow, removing waste, visually collaborating are all really important concepts. Yeah. And one of the things that we had talked about is that there's not just one kind of mapping that, you know, there's different kinds of mappings to look at when you're going down this path. Tell us about that. I think this is very complicated for teams that are new to these sort of concepts to kind of grapple with. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often I'll start a conversation with somebody and realize they're talking about an entirely different sort of mapping. So this table really helps us understand broadly the differences between Valley Stream process and customer journey mapping. So our value stream map is a really high level like helicopter or bird's eye view down onto the processes or steps or activities that make up a value stream. And a value stream is anything that delivers a product or a service. Um, and then for the process mapping, and these two are often commonly confused. As I just said, the value stream is made up of processes. So we'll look at one later, but for as an example, um, in a technology value stream, one of your processes might be testing. Mm -hmm. So that's one of your components. But if you wanted to do some process mapping, you would do it in testing, or you would do it in environment provisioning, or you would do it in planning or something. You do it deep into one of those processes. And they look quite different. We're not going to show you an example of process mapping today, but a process map looks much more like a workflow diagram with sort of arrows and, and options and th different things might happen. Um, and then customer journey mapping is talking about what happens to the customer as they go through the experience of finding out about your company, finding out about your product, exploring whether they want to buy your product and then the actual experience of buying your product and then um, having and owning and, and uh, maintaining your product, whether it's mm -hmm. a mobile app or a washing machine or whatever it is. So those are kind of the top level differences. So value stream mapping is about the flow of value, whereas process mapping cares about the flow of the actual work and then the experience for customer journey mapping. And they have kind of these different functions. So value stream mapping, as I have said quite a few times, it's really about getting a number of people looking at the same thing and talking about that thing, so that visual collaboration. Whereas in process mapping, we're really diagramming that workflow to communicate it and record it um, and then the visual representation of the experience is the customer journey um, mapping idea. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Is that well, we, we might have to do uh, more on those as we go forward. <laughs> I guess yeah. we're going we're gonna to get quite a bit about it. <laughs> um, moving us forward, because um, we, we should, is, you know, why, uh, why do value stream mapping? This comes back to the very core of why do anything that Lean asks us to do. So we're all about minimizing waste in order to maximize customer value. That at the very center of it is what we're trying to achieve. And do you have any examples of where this has worked out well? 
Well, the advisory mapping typically, in my experience, shows somewhere between 30 and 60 percent reduction in waste. So once a bunch of people have done what we're going to do in a few minutes and got these um, processes up on a wall or a, a whiteboard and started to think about where the delays are, i.e. where the waste is happening, where the constraints are, so where there are bottlenecks in the flow of work, and start figuring out to, how to um, remove that. Um, you know, I've seen uh, organisations that have had uh, things like ring fencing different areas of their organisation has taken them over 300 days to do um, mm -hmm. in their first experience of it and they've realised it's something they're going to need to do again so they thought they'd map it for improvement and then once we've mapped it they realised that they can reduce that to 90 days um, and they've got a bunch of people in a room. This is one of the most powerful things about value stream mapping that I don't think we talk about enough which is that um, you often get a bunch of people in a room that haven't been in a room to get together before exactly. and mm -hmm. the empathy and the learning about each other's jobs in the context of the flow of the work through their common end-to-end -end value stream is quite remarkable. So as a facilitator, what practitioners of value stream mapping will find that actually quite a lot of their job when they're conducting a value stream mapping exercise is to keep the conversation on track and help people um, not go down what I call a rabbit hole. So you know when a discussion gets just at too deep a level and it's going on too long. So I'll introduce you to my friend Elmo. He's a top <laughs> top tip with value stream mapping practitioners. Um, he stands for enough. Let's move on. That's the acronym for Elmo. So mm -hmm. that practitioners often take him to these sort of exercises because it's a nice, polite way of kind of saying, okay, let's stop talking about that and move on. <laughs> let's park it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, and, and I haven't done that many value stream mapping exercises, and the ones I have done have been enlightening. To see the lights go on in people's eyes as they have that, oh my gosh, I didn't know you guys were doing that, and it's always you guys, um, to where the problem and the empathy you, talks about, you talk about, where we come together on a common goal. I mean, when I think about the cultural implications of DevOps, it's, that was the whole intent. Let's bring ops and devs together so that we can have a shared goal of what's happening. Value stream mapping very much has, in my experience, done the same thing where um, everyone comes together to understand let's how do we make this more efficient, better quality, or or whatever the goal of that mapping experience was. And I'm sure oh. you'll have seen this as well. You talked about bringing dev and ops together. And I think mm -hmm. as DevOps has become more mature, we felt the gap between technology and the business more mm -hmm. severe. So actually getting the business and technology in the room together is a great um, outcome for value stream mapping and getting people to understand where those ideas are coming from in our fuzzy front end um, exactly. and getting them to be there as well yeah yep exactly 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 well diving in there's um i i love this concept that you present which is there's you know, the goal of value stream mapping is to find waste and you have some categories of waste. So tell us about that. Yeah, so this again is from the, the lean manufacturing canon. So this is kind of standard lean approaches to doing stuff. And it's quite interesting to look at it through our technology lens. So the acronym is downtime and then you can see the, the different types of waste that were identified as part of the, the lean manufacturing work uh, here. So we've got the defects, um, fairly easy to understand that one, overproduction, waiting, underutilized or non-utilized talent, transportation, so the unnecessary movements of products and materials, inventory, so excess products and materials not being processed, uh, motion, so unnecessary movement by people, and then extra processing. So we look at this and you're probably, the audience is probably looking at it going, well, it's all very well, but how do we apply this to our mm -hmm. Uh, technology environment because we're not a manufacturing factory that's right which kind of takes us here it's to say where does this data come from how, how do you figure that out so we try and look at it through a different way so we're kind of thinking about defects and defects is probably the easiest one i've just noticed this like, little table's fallen off the end a little bit we probably haven't got enough time to go through all of the, the <clears throat> time part of it anyway but um Defects, uh, you know, how, how does the waste manifest? It's the amount of time spent fixing bugs and paying down as technical debt. So 
uh, we then ask ourselves, okay, so we know how what a defect is, but how do we find data about it in order to make changes to it? So right. in this case, defects, we'd expect our defects to sit probably in our CI server, um, maybe some additional data in our testing tools. And of course, our service desk is probably giving us some data around things like change fail rate and MTTR that might be useful at this point as well. Um, we probably don't want to go through one by one, but overproduction is quite an interesting one. This, I love this kind of feast or famine uh, things. I think it was John Smart then at Barclays talk uh, yeah. that PMO's dead long with the PMO, where he's got those gorgeous kind of moving graphics where it explains the kind of feast and famine of requirements into tech teams. And you'll remember how those tech teams, when they didn't get enough food, they started making their own. And it's, it's kind, of, kind of an interesting one because for me, if you... If you, if make, you give a developers a bunch of time and say, you know, there's no new requirements coming in, go part. It, it, interesting things happen. They, uh, d definitely. And I think I find it even more interesting because if you think about the fact that we say um, every company is a technology company or a software company and technology is so significant for a company's future and it's so strategic, then you would maybe naturally say, well, in that case, the technology team should be driving some of the requirements for the product. If they are that yep. strategic. But when you kind of say, well, it's a bit naughty of them to create their own because they were starved of them from the business, we're showing that we've still got that gap in our value stream between the business and then the order takers of the technology team. So it's kind of a, it just smells a little bit of a bit of a cultural problem. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. Um, I, it, there's some other aspects here that are, are interesting. I know we don't want to go through this all, all together, but transportation I thought was interesting because that that feels a lot manufacturing-ish when, uh, you know, frankly, so does inventory. Um, what What's your take on that being related to uh, technology? I know the team can't say it, we could talk about motion as well, but yeah, the transportation one is really interesting. We've got some examples here about unnecessary emails and irrelevant reporting. And I think everyone on the call um, will probably uh, identify with both of those and you know, the amount of email that goes around. and. I think we're all moving to an extent to Slack and or Teams and or instant messaging platforms and a lot of the kind of lightweight communication is happening there and we're probably using email for the kind of more heavyweight kind of you know longer amounts of text that need to be shared with more people probably maybe even links that need to be shared with multiple people and we haven't got a channel set up for them maybe, maybe there's some inside the company and some out whatever but I think we are reducing the amount of emails but I think we're going to end up with a slightly different problem which I'm sure people have heard it's like well now do I do I email them or do I slack them or do I whatsapp them or do I LinkedIn message them or do I this now now we've got loads of communication channels right and, right or do I just track it in the tools and you I, I it's so many right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get on your phone and you don't know if you're going to slack or text message or phone call message or uh, email and it's crazy and I hear there's no hope of creating some kind of universal communications connector because none of the, the communications channels want to do it. I mean, that seems like the obvious thing to me is just have like one screen. Anyway, we're drifting off the topic somewhat there. <laughs> um, Very so, true. All right. Well, we'll I'll, I'll, I'll move us forward into doing actual value stream mapping. Um, a, a bit of comment, man. There's uh, this topic has taken off. Um, it feels like every vendor in the planet now is is doing value stream mapping, so it's it's a movement. And value stream management is also a topic there. Um, but uh, doing this well and understanding the fundamentals is pretty key, and um, I, that's why this is good. So walk us through uh, how the process works. We haven't got that slide in here, but I just wanted to say that part <clears throat> of what you described is because of this, right? So. What we've learned is that using value stream mapping is a really powerful way of getting a baseline check of where a team is when they're on a yep. DevOps journey. Um, mm -hmm. Like any kind of baseline check, like assessments, whatever, it should be a continuous process. Um, and we'll come back to that point later. But we're going to talk about the practicalities of doing a value stream map if you've never done one before. Um, I would suggest you got Karen Martin's book if you're brand new to this um, and a lot of practitioners base um, that their approaches on her work and, and the, the other mics, uh, Robert Osterling um, and Orzen that we mentioned when we looked at the books earlier. But mm -hmm. the first thing you need to do is 
find yourself or nominate somebody as the value stream mapping coordinator. Sure. And then you need to identify what value stream you're going to map. So in this case, um, in this little exercise we're going to run through today, we're going to map our mobile app value stream. So then you need to identify the people that are going to come and help you map that value stream. And you need a mixture of people, and you probably want about 10 or 12 of them, and they need to be people that represent every end-to-end -end activity. So from here, you can see we've got from idea to release. So you need to have people that understand every bit of it. Um, and then you need some senior people in there. And this, Jeff, could be quite hard to get senior people in the room. This is kind of one of the, the big things, that big objections around value stream mapping is just seems like we're all just come by our moment, we're just going to get in a room again. But I'll remind you about how we remove 30 to 60 percent of waste out of a process, a set of processes when we do this kind of work. So um, we've got our people ready. Um, we then get a date and a time, uh, and you can run all of this remotely. You don't have to be in the same space. There are lots of different tools um, like Mural um, and these are charts and things like that that you can use to do the kind of work that you uh, might have traditionally done on a wall with post-it notes. But the first thing your team are going to do is decide together what the steps are in their value stream. So in this very simplified example today, you can see we've got five steps. So it starts with the light bulb idea. Um, mm -hmm. And then the team, um, probably after several hours of discussion and having parallel processes and moving things in and out, and it's not unusual for an existing value stream to have 20, 25 of these steps in it to begin with. And they will include things like cabs or change approval and advisory boards, and maybe even several of them. Um, we've got one post-it note in this example for test. And you may often find that you've got multiple testing stages um, through your route to live. We've got one uh, post-it note for release here. Um, quite often we have different sets of releases. And releases right. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the whole fuzzy front end is really short on this um, our example here as well. So lots of people will have like right requirements, stakeholder workshop, approvals, uh, budgeting, architecture, more design. So there'll be lots and lots of steps often. But this is your first step is to get your activities or processes from your light bulb, your idea to receiving your value uh, in place. Yeah, and you brought up a good point. I, uh, my um, limited experience in doing it uh, really found a lot of value of actually showing the visuals to the group because then people were ready to lop on and, and throw more at it um, and to really help refine the picture. And it, be, it got people to engage. That's the visual collaboration element of it, absolutely. Giving people the opportunity to put things on the board and move them around and everyone being able to see what everyone else is seeing. Yeah. Cool. Well, once there, then there's another step of, of analysis that goes on. Tell us about this next step. Yeah, I'm going to start adding some metrics. And this is really interesting because so many times I've done this and then people have said to me at the end, they've added up all these numbers we're about to create. And then they've gone, we knew it was that, but we didn't know what all the individual numbers were. So they'll end up with sort of 220 days and they'll, they'll say, I knew it took us like a year. Because if you think about it, it's working days, right? Um, and but they'll say I didn't realize you know that we half of that was spent in analysis or something so what we've got on the top line here is we've got uh, what we call or what different practitioners call them different things so you could call them uh, touch time or processing time or active time it's basically the elapsed time that something is actually happening in that step and then the 10 days in the red underneath the little bit like that that's the uh, idle time or wait time or inactive time. That's the time um, between the work around the idea stopping and the work around the analysis step starting. So that's yep. a, normally a lot of this when we've got lots of separate silo teams. So one team will stop and then they'll be waiting for another team to pick up the work. One so of the, the common team... questions. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was going to say one of the common questions that I get is um, it, you know what if I have ten people working on it and it takes them four days versus one person it takes them two days? How, I, that was one of the common questions I remember getting. Yeah, we're going to come to that. We're going to add that level of metrics shortly. Well, in in a real 
mapping exercise probably in a couple of hours because this step on its own takes a, a long time and I think it reflects on what I'm about to say when we get to the last few slides but this is a human centric opinion driven exercise we've got heads and brains and I'm not saying they're not useful they're incredibly useful and they're in surprisingly accurate um, but this is data that people are at this stage data that people are discussing based on their experience so you will have discussion where some people will say I think it takes longer than that and you'll have a lot of discussion where people will say well sometimes it takes five days and sometimes it takes 50 days so we've simplified the model that we're using here but some practitioners use models where they'll have minimum and maximum um, mm -hmm. time for these so you can end up with some quite complex calculations where you have min uh, total touch time and maximum total touch time and minimum total wait time and maximum total wait time so you can end up with some some quite complex calculations going on sure sure any other advice as we're putting these things together and and um and, and running these on on actually figuring out the the handoff times for example yeah well i think one of my top <clears throat> tips on this try not to get in a muddle with different um ways of measuring your time so you're seeing that we're using days here um if you start doing some in days and some in weeks and some in hours it gets quite complicated to tot it all up at the end so it's best to try and keep to one time unit and you can write yourself a calculator pretty easily in excel or in google sheets that basically you just put in um, the process type and then put in what the wait time is and the touch time and and just automatically add it um, and you know that might seem looking at the fairly simple fairly stream example that we've got on screen today it may seem like a really unnecessary thing to do but when you've got 24 steps and it's kind of scribbled everywhere um, and you're asking people to add it up just before they have their lunch. Um, it's quite sensible just to have a spreadsheet and have a, an assistant or even you doing it yourself where you're just putting the numbers in your spreadsheet and it also just automatically adds it up for you. And I think one of the advantages of doing it that way is it does discipline your mind to think, am I in hours or am I in days? And you mm -hmm. kind of start learning, you know, how, that five days is 40 hours and things like that. How do you handle the um issue where while you're drawing this out and and people are putting things up they start getting these great ideas like oh i didn't know we did that that's stupid let's cut that piece out or automate that up here or how do you handle those things so you can't one of the things you can do you said earlier so you park it so you can often just have a, a separate board this is our car park and then the thing that's kind of outside of our scope um, we'll put in the car park and when i say outside of scope one of the things that you can do as the person leading this exercise is create a charter or a scope document that basically says this is what we're going to be talking about this is our value stream this is who's in the room this is what we're going to be doing um mm -hmm. you know these are the challenges this is what we're not going to talk about so we're not going to talk about that particularly painful integration with that third party that we know we can't influence for example you might take something like that completely off the table um, and then the other thing that the facilitator needs to do is um, keep the team focused on the job in hand. So typically a value stream mapping will fall in, session will fall into two parts. So the first part will be identifying the current state and then the second mm -hmm. part will be building the future state. So if somebody's going, I've got this incredible idea, we should be doing this, but you're on current state, that's where you say that is a brilliant idea, but we're going to we are solutionizing for the next stage of work so we're going to write it down and put it over here and come back to it tomorrow or next week or whenever we've been rescheduled um to get back and do that next stage wonderful well and part of this is gathering the metrics so that we can look at what that future state will look at so we better figure out what our metrics are for the current state so walk us through these metrics that we're putting together in the calculator you talked about Yes, yeah, so we haven't completed this example for people, but basically where you can see it says touch time and we've got four days under idea, you would have a number under analysis and development and test and release, and you'd have the same under the wait times where you've got the 10 days in red, you'd have the same under there. So once you've got all of those complete, you can sum your touch times and then sum your wait time. So you'll know what your total amount of touch time is and your total amount of wait time. And then you sum both your totals. And at that point you have the all important metric which is the cycle time. And this is our flow, our end-to-end -end flow metric. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one, the key one we're trying to influence when we're doing value stream mapping. So when you do your future state map, you do exactly the same thing, 
um, but you talk about those improvements, what would happen if we automated testing, what would happen if we didn't have to wait six weeks for security to do a penetration test, what would happen if we didn't have to wait eight weeks for an environment to be provisioned, what would happen if we didn't have to wait four weeks for a shared test environment to become available, all of those sort of questions, so we resolve all those questions and we're like right now we can take that delay out, we can take that delay out, and we end up with a new cycle time. Now, what these other grey metrics give us is we get a view for how many people are involved. So Jeff said earlier, one of the things that he's often asked it, when we put in the, that four days in touch time for idea, is that 10 people working for four days each? Or is that four people working for one day on the same day? That's an elapsed time. So that's four days. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Stop. What we do next is we now say, well, during that time, we've got our business analysts and we've got our product owner, for example, we might say, and we've got our business stakeholders. So we might say we've got three people from two different teams. We'll say the business analysts and the product owner in the same team. Um, so we put the team names down, then we say, right, we've got three FTEs. So we'll say, I know actually we've got four FTEs because we had four business, there are two business analysts working on that. So we've got four full time employees. And then we'll put um, how much of their time in that four days. So we'd say that well the big the business stakeholder pretty much just dropped by someone's desk for half an hour and described what they wanted and then the product owner spent another three hours trying to refine it over the following two days and then the business analyst both spent a day working on it together to produce a design so then you put a percentage of those four days against each of those heads and then that final number we've got there is the percentage of rework so what we're then saying is how when they push that work downstream to analysis um, how much of that work then comes back and they have to change it and there's what we call a mirror metric for that which is percentage complete and accurate so um, if something is 80 percent complete and accurate it is 20 percent reworked mm -hmm. beautiful and then, yeah that <clears throat> enables you if you want to build a spreadsheet for it you can do something that then tells you how many hours how many man hours have been worked um, during that period and then you can also then decide on an average hourly rate across all of your employees and you could work out um, the costs of moving that enhancement through your value stream gotcha and how do you uh, a couple of on the calculations you talked about the percent rework how do you you know from a software point of view how do you, what, what does it mean rework? And how do you figure that out? Uh, if, if, if I'm manufacturing a widget and it comes down, I can easily calculate, oh, these 10 were bad, I have a batch of 100. So I know that my rework percentage is 10%. But how does that fit to software? So in a, <laughs> in a value stream mapping exercise, it's again, that human driven narrative. So it's very much built on opinion and feeling. So it's things like, um, how often does development release or commit a piece of code and it fails the test whether it's automated or manual and gets put back into development to remediate how often do we put something into the release cycle and it hasn't done everything it should do in the checklist so it has to go back to development to test to go back into release how often do we release it into production um, and it needs to be remediated so it's in the value stream mapping exercise it's very much a kind of finger in the air exercise which is one of the disadvantages of value stream mapping the other being that it's quite difficult to make a continuous improvement process understood um and um i did notice when on on the experiences i had people would actually have arguments over how much was the rework and how bad was it but once they agreed on it, they did agree to ranges. And once we got to ranges, it was interesting to know, you could start to see where the problems were in the entire flow. Oh, the requirements were bad up here, which led to the wrong things being analyzed, the wrong things being built, and and all at the end where the wrong things were coming out. So gosh, the, the team was able to point back and say, let's fix it up here where uh, it's more important. How, but that does bring me to the question, how do you figure out where to focus when you're doing your future state value stream map? When you're, when you're looking at all this and your calculations sort of formed out, what, what kind of advice do you have for figuring out where to poke? It's a really good question. And it's you know, <laughs> such a common scenario as well. I mean, what you've just described is if you basically put crap in, you're gonna get crap out. I mean, one of the, 
one of the early, um, very early DevOps specific assessments. I was doing a lot of different types of assessments pre DevOps, but when, one of the first ones I did, an organization came to me and they said, we've got um, a massive problem with the quality of the software that's coming through from our third party um, software partner and we need to automate our testing. And I was like, well, just hang on a minute. Maybe we should just look at what's going on before we just pile in a load of tools um, in the testing arena. Um, and as you just alluded to, what was actually more of a problem was the collaboration between around the requirements. So what they were getting were poorly defined requirements, not actually poorly built software. Um, and, you know, no matter how far you shift testing, testing left, if you've broken that part in terms of requirements definition, you've kind of got no hope, really. Um, so back to your question, which was how do you know where to focus? Um, as practitioners, um, there are a couple of different things you can do. One is you can try and do more pre-work. So you can do things like hold a, a prep workshop or ask them for discovery documents or send out email surveys or do very lightweight interviews or conversations with people who are involved to try and get a feel for where the problems are. Um, or you can, and that's, you know, that's probably the best, most ideal way of doing stuff in terms of like, prepping the process. The problem with it is that it's not always possible to get everybody to engage. Sure. Um, yeah. So you kind of need a backup <laughs> plan. And backup plan is to use this process in itself. So one of the steps that a lot of practitioners use that we didn't talk about today was you can, um, as part of this, when you've got your, and we, you know, we've only got the five points in it today, but imagine you've got 24, um, you might see glaring bits where there's like a 38 day wait or something between two steps. So you literally just circle them um, and you can say, right, this is where we're going to focus in where we do the future state mapping. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you can do as a practitioner, uh, which is very Karen Martin style, um, is identify what we call the value added steps or the value adding steps. Mm -hmm. So. You ask and everyone um, will ask the practitioner what they mean by value adding step. And that's what you kind of need the team to figure out for themselves. But basically a value adding step is where the work that's actually being done results in something tangibly valuable for the customer. So this gets some really interesting conversations going. So for example, in this uh, example in front of us, the analysis phase is actually not particularly value adding. Um, the dev phase is, that's where we're building the thing they're going to use. And then the test phase is the one where I always used to end up putting a dotted line around it because it's not directly value adding, but we cannot live without it under any circumstances. But even though there's not always perfect answers, they always generate really useful conversations. Mm -hmm. And that's the point I think we keep on coming back to when we do this stuff. Very true. Now. I know that a lot of people get or mix up value stream mapping from value stream management, but they are indeed different. And maybe you can uh, help us understand the differences between them. And I've kind of set myself up and us up a little bit for this today by kind of saying things like this is human driven, it's narrative, it's opinion driven, it's difficult to repeat and all that kind of stuff. And it is incredibly useful and I don't want to diminish it. There's a reason that the DevOps handbook recommends it. It's a reason why um, all practitioners love to do it um, as part of the DevOps journey, because it does help so much with empathy, trust, getting the stories out, visually collaborating together and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but it is opinion driven. So um, where man value stream management is different is it is tool centric. So it's data driven, it's quantitative. Um, so we have kind of real science and insight behind it. And the two for me go absolutely hand in hand. So my recommendation is that organizations start by doing the human elements um, and whilst they're working through that, they figure out how to automate it moving forward. So with value stream mapping, we visually collaborate, but value stream management then automatically extracts all that data, all that touch time, wait time, all of that data we were just looking at, your cycle time, having conversations about MTTR um, and other um, DORA metrics and other flow metrics. It automates all of that in a way that 
um, once you've got value stream management up and running, you no longer need to get your whole group of people in a team to spend hours looking and figuring out the data again. You can extract it from the systems, and we'll look at this in a bit more detail in a minute, but you can inspect and adapt um, according to what you're seeing from the systems. Um, and when you first introduce value stream management, you can actually use it to validate what you learned from your value stream mapping exercise mm -hmm. and then move to automated generation of those metrics and then um, be very quickly able to apply the human uh, element of the process, which is the inspection and adaptation. Absolutely. So it's not like you just get the data, then poof, everything changes. You, it sounds like you're going to have to do something with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and maybe talking about the process of what do you do with it then? How does it work when you put these things together? So this is the improvement carta, um, which many people may know from the, the lean canon. So a carta being a Japanese word for a habit, so anything you repeat over and over. And what we've done is just very slightly adapt it here for what you might do with the, the improvement carta in context of value stream mapping. So you would set your long-term vision and goals, which is probably you'd, something you discuss in the scoping part of your value stream mapping exercise, which is number one. <clears throat> number two, you create your current stream, value stream map. Number three, you set your next target value stream map. And number four, you PDCA or plan, do, check, act. So you experiment between those two states. And this is where people kind of fall down because they'll write themselves a whole massive list of things they're going to do to change their value stream map. And then they don't do them all, but they don't even do the, they don't do the check. They kind of do the plan, do. They plan, do, plan, do, plan, do, but do, never do the check out, basically. Yeah, you don't. it's almost like you, you don't get to take credit for making improvements because you never showed that you made improvements. Yeah. It's um, <clears throat> interesting. Well, and, you know, you've actually expanded on this a bit as well. Yeah, so the, the suggestion is that you are, that there are opportunities to use all of this data and use this data in the disciplines that we all know and love in our agile ways of working. So we're already setting our long-term vision, um, often with things like OKRs, so objectives mm -hmm. and results that people set at the top end. But then we've got things like our, um, you know, with, with current, we just with our current base stream map, we discover what our current cycle time is, but then we can continually measure it using value stream management. So. We can use data from our value stream management tool, like Plutora, in our sprint review, for example. So we've now got transparency to inspect our current cycle time and inspect our progress towards our sprint goal and our OKR measurement. Um, and sort of before that, in our planning bit, we can set our sprint goals in our sprint planning, which are aligned with our OKR improvement and recording in Plutora. So our sprint gives us a natural cycle to do plan, do, check, act and our value stream management tool gives us the platform to have the data to do that checking. So instead of going plan, do, plan, do, plan, do, just use the sprint cadence to do the check act. Well, very cool. And then your value stream mapping exercise is just continuously doing a future state off of what you currently have and rinse and repeat all through the process. Incrementally, and um, we love incrementally. What a concept. <laughs> well, yeah. let's look. <laughs> Let's look at where you, you talk about data here and, and aligning this in. Let's talk about where some of this data comes from. All over the place, isn't it? This yeah. is the really bit. I mean, you know, we've given a few examples of tools here, but I'm sure anybody that's been involved with or tried to build or tried to consume a DevOps tool chain knows how many different tools um, there are for each category. Um, and we've only, we haven't actually given you tools categories totally here. What we've given you is the DORA metrics um, for throughput and stability. So uh, the DevOps research and assessment metrics for deployment frequency and lead time, which here is from commit to uh, co-commit to production. And then we've got stability from, uh, which is change rate, fail rate and MTTR. Um, and then we've got a number of tools categories and then some examples of tools. And this is where it gets really complicated for the people that are trying to build, manage and consume the DevOps tool chain because there's all these different parts. How do they integrate to each other? How do we get the metrics and the data out of them? And this is really uh, the strength of the value stream management part of it because it does it all for you. Um, we talked about getting the cycle time metric out of value stream mapping. Uh, what's happening here is we've now got value stream management getting the cycle time out of all of these tools for us and allowing us 
uh, to do that inspection at our sprint review cycle. Mm -hmm. Very cool, which is kind of the whole point. At the end of the day, I, I remember, um, you know, it, it, if you can't show the improvement, um, I, it's tough. You, you want to be able to show that you've done better than you have in the past with the billions that have been spent on tooling and methodologies. And uh, Lean's been around for 20 years. DevOps has been around for 10 years. We're shifting from a project-oriented to product-oriented type uh, decentralized development. I, from a management point of view, it's all been black box. It just uh, lots of money spent. And here you have an opportunity by investing in the tools to use data-driven decision-making to invest in those areas that have the greatest impact to your factory. Granted, I get software is not the same as a, as a typical kind of creating widgets, but at the end of the day, the need for, you know, like you pointed out, Helen, the need for providing transparency uh, into the software factory uh, a catwalk above the factory floor, if you will, is, is still needed. It, it, we need to have a different mentality. For so long, I think we've, uh, as technology people, have beaten management into the idea like it's, it's too much art. You, you can't know what's going on. It's not. There's tons of data here. And we have the systems in place to do that. Um, and, and maybe this is a bit where, where I could pipe in about what is value stream management itself. Um, I love that uh, Forrester and Chris Kondo and Charlie Betts have, have really pushed this forward um, as the combination of people process technology that maps and outlines and optimizes and visualize and the whole process. And I won't read it to you, but there's a the, the power of using value stream management tooling in your enterprise is massive. It acts as a way to pull together your software delivery pipelines, all the tooling together in a single location so you can get visibility into what's going on. This is part of the process that you'll need as you optimize your pipelines, just like Helen's been talking about of, of, of first uh, visualize what you have going on, pull the data together, uh, plan to act and continue that um, as a standard part of your process. You know, the, the point of any digital transformation isn't to uh, say you've now arrived and you, you've done your digital transformation. If, if that's the goal, um, you're doing it wrong. Um, you're, you're not going to go out and buy digital transformation no more than you're going to go buy a DevOps and, and now you're there. Uh, no more than you're going to buy value stream management. The point is we want to put in place a system for continuous improvement. This is that system. This is that methodology. And Plutora is one of the leaders. Um, a note about the... Um, value stream management wave from Forrester. Uh, there's a new one set to release here and not too long, you'll be hearing news about it. It's kind of exciting what's happened in the last 18 months and the different changes. Um, so expect to hear some more news from us. From a platform perspective, just to take, to take a couple of minutes, um, Platora's platform is a cloud-based solution. We ingest data from across the tool chain. We do management and orchestration and governance all across that. We provide visualizations of that data. We help you see and visualize what has been largely unseen and really stitch together what's happening in the planning into what's happening in development, what's going on into production. And through the power of visibility comes efficiency and um, uh, velocity improvements. You get faster simply because you can make things easier. By seeing, you're no longer blind and um, you can make things go better. We talked a bit about the door metrics. That's something that we also allow you to do is go pick a pipeline and go look at the um, various things that are flowing through and what it is from check-in to production. We'll give you other metrics through those pipelines as well. So in conclusion, um, Helen, give us the uh, give us the summary thoughts here. Value stream mapping, incredibly powerful way of um, starting or accelerating or catalyzing a DevOps journey, but it will give you some manual overhead that you can automate out so that you can create transparency and inspect and adapt at will if you use value stream mapping. Sorry, management, importantly. A management mapping, understood. Um, well, let's bump over. I know we have just a couple of minutes for questions. Let me see if I can grab. What is the meaning of OKR? Objective key result. 
tell us about why we would use that. Just uh, oh, yes. Gosh, I've only got a minute. I'm yeah. I have a lot of discussions <laughs> with organisations about these. My problem with OKRs is they tend to be set. Uh, they 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 smell of command and control, right? And what mm -hmm. we want is we want autonomous teams. So whilst we want clarity and vision and great leadership, great leadership in the DevOps world is all about helping teams self-discover. So teams can have OKRs, but they should maybe come up with them themselves. And the prob one of the other problems with OKRs is they tend to be set over very long time periods. Um, and as we've already said, incremental is one of our favorite ways of working in Agile and DevOps. So what teams should be doing is continually uh, incrementally experimenting with improvements in their team that they self-discover. Love it, love it, love it. Um, uh, there's a question, I'm currently value stream mapping a release management process. Can you share some tips on your experience in managing release management? Um, why don't we both take that one up? I, I can start. Hey, part of what Platora offers is management and orchestration. One of the major functions that we provide is release management. And we incorporate that to expand not just the process from, hey, you've got stuff checking into production, but we actually expand that for the entire value stream. Release being one of the more critical portions of that, so you can look at all the different parts of the process happening. Um, how do you create a value stream map for that? Just the same. Here's your steps from, here's when you're scoping, here's when you're deciding is you know your, your scope block, to here's your validation, to your tests, all those things have a very natural progression that lend themselves well to value stream mapping. And you can start tracking the times off of it. You can track all the activities and so forth. That's part of what um, that's part of what we do. And doing a value stream mapping exercise off of it has been um, extremely valuable, getting the right people in the room. Helen, do you want to take a swing at that too? Yeah, I'd also have a crack at process mapping it as well. So looking at kind of the workflow diagrams um, within it and seeing it as a component in the value stream map. So Very cool. Yeah. Uh, do you first create a value stream map and then you apply value stream management? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very simply stated. <laughs> yeah, value stream mapping is the first step. And then you're going to understand some of the tools and metrics that you're looking for so that you can understand the the amount of processing time that you're going to need and and really where the inefficiencies lie that will then help you set goals for your future state what okrs do you need and um where do you need to draw data together and then you'll work with doing value stream management on top of it to put it together so uh, it must be our time uh oh you're on mute <laughs> sorry Sorry, I was just saying mom's home, so I guess uh, you have to stop your party. <laughs> um, real quick, I, I do apologize. This is all the time that we have for question and answer period. Um, but please know that uh, Jeff and Helen will be getting a copy of all the questions. We had so many questions coming in. I was watching them. I'm like, oh my God, so many great questions. So they'll get the copies of all the questions. So I'm sure that they'll be more than happy to follow up with you guys offline to make sure that your questions are answered. But I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. Like I said, there were a ton of really great ones. Also want to remind the audience real quick that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the events, or if you just want to watch it again, uh, you'll have the opportunity to do so. We will be sending out an email after today's webinar that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website, so you can always go look for it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the upcoming, or sorry, in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Okay, guys, uh, before we close things out, um, I did want to go ahead and do the question, sorry, the drawing for the six uh, $25 Amazon gift cards. Uh, so without further ado, our first winner today is uh, Alina W. Congratulations, Alina. Our next winner today is Brad P. Congratulations, Brad. Our third winner today is Debbie B. Congratulations, Debbie. Fourth winner is Gary G. Congratulations, Gary. Fifth winner today is Holly M. Congratulations, Holly. And our final winner today is 
Marianne G. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, we'll be reaching out to you via email with your $25 Amazon gift cards. Please check your inbox. If it's not there, check your spam folder. Uh, Jeff, Helen, as always, great presentation. Um, you guys, you guys are so much fun to uh, to do a webinar with, and and I you know always have such really great information. So, uh, thank you very much as always for your expertise and your time, and uh, just for being such good eggs. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Also, want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe.